Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and otaku of all ages to the... Let me pull up the name. Sorry, we are experiencing a little bit of a difficulty because this is a, pr- a first episode. It is called the Heavy Storms Podcast. Um, uh, your monthly bad anime discussion podcast for Infinite Rainy Day. Joining me are my two lovely hosts... We'll start off all the way from Britain. It's Tama. Say hello. Hi. <laughs> and um, from, I'm not sure exactly where in the States, but I'm sure it's pretty close to my time zone. Uh, give it up for Megan. Something's wrong here. Oh, there's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong in the world. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize that Megan sounds an awful lot like someone I'm, I'm, I've heard before before. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Who do I sound like, then? You sound like Lilac, anime reviews. Uh, no. That's a lie. <laughs> that is a lie. Um, yeah, for those of you who aren't in on the joke, and that's like, pretty much everybody, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, had, we, we had a, a technical difficulty. Originally, Megan was supposed to join us, but she had to drop out last night. And uh, we had a, uh, I had a, bad, a bit of a mad rush trying to find a replacement. So instead, we picked up a regular from the site as well, who happened to also watch the movie for the first time. So it's Stephanie. Yeah, this is literally a last, last last minute change and a last 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 minute person coming in mind you it's okay i was once (laughs) called in for a last minute replacement so i know what it's like it happens it happens yeah uh don't worry megan uh you'll get your chance Maybe as a host next time, we'll see. Just as, also as a, as a bit of a, a precursor, because of how uh, people's schedules work and because of the topics that we're going to be using in the future, because in the future they're going to be selected via a random generator, I'm not going to be on this every single episode, and neither will Tamo or Steph. So you will see the, the roster of hosts alternate every month. Yeah, the the entire staff you're at least going to hear at some point in some time. It's just not going to be the same three people every single time. <laughs> yeah, and then this is also the only episode that I'm aware of where we actually voted on the topic. Speaking of which, who wants to introduce today's topic? Wait, wasn't Tama the one who suggested it in the first yeah. place? So the anime that I nominated for the our first episode is Goro Miyazaki's Tales from Earthsea. So it's actually an interesting story. Uh, Tama did suggest it, but it was on top of, was it six other options? And we spent like two and a half hours arguing over what would be what. And then finally we put it up to a vote. I don't remember being a part of that part of the conversation. I just was like, sure, ter- Tales from Earthsea, why not? I kind of came in late. All right, so let I guess we should probably give some some history on our personal experiences before we actually discuss it. Uh, Tama, you can go first. In terms, in terms of actually, what I, when I first saw the film, or just well, just just like a brief, a brief history with your relationship with the film. You can include like when you first saw it as well. The my view, basically, I got into anime and particularly into Studio Ghibli stuff, probably as like the first thing I ever saw in terms of anime. I mean, I can remember the when I actually so first saw a. F- trailer for something I think it was one of one particular um, anime season on the UK's film four and that was largely Miyazaki's films. Uh, I think Tales of Earthsea was one of the first anime films I've actually seen in a cinema so that's my um, relationship with the film. Okay. And they only, I believe in the UK they only released it as a sub, as the subbed version. Okay. Uh, and Steph how about you? I well, I, there's not much with you, but we'll, we'll go for it anyway. <laughs> um, my experience with the film. Bef- right before recording this, I watched the film for the first time like two hours ago. <laughs> That's the gist of it right there. Okay. It's fine. Like, I, I, uh, Megan hadn't seen it either, so you, you're not alone. Um, One way or the other. Yeah, anyway, um... My relationship with the film is actually complicated. Like Tama, I had... Uh, initially gotten into Studio Ghibli as like, it was kind of like my official gateway 
into anime, even though technically I had seen bits and pieces of different shows here and there. And uh, I remember um, I had done a blog on Screw Attack in version 4 discussing my initial thoughts on different Studio Ghibli movies. And one of the guys said, like, have you ever seen Tales from Earthsea? So I'm like, no, I haven't. And he said, well, that's one of the, the two really bad Studio Ghibli movies directed by Hayao Miyazaki's son. Now, when they say that, look, just keep in mind, like Studio Ghibli, like any other studio has that has a long running history, not all their stuff is equal. That's a given. Like even Pixar and all their stuff is equal. I think we can agree on that. Mm. Oh yeah. I, I, I personally think the, the Miyazaki's core work is, is good. I mean, yeah, Miyazaki's made, I would say two middling films and one not terribly brilliant one. Um, the other two guys in Ghibli, well, the other three guys in Ghibli, one of them only made um, Whisper of the Heart and I believe um, died shortly after production of it. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, I looked it up online and I found out that it had, I think at the time, like a 42% on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, okay. And uh, Rotten Tomatoes is an interesting site because a 60 is considered a fresh and a 75 and above is considered a certified fresh. And every Studio Ghibli movie, except for Tales from Earthsea, as of right now, qualifies in the certified fresh range. So that should give you another sense right there. Yeah, like the the next one, uh, the next one after uh, Tales from Earthsea is My Neighbors the Amadas at a seventy-five. Oh. <laughs> Where does um, our Pom Poppy Hill work up uh, work on that um, Rotten Tomatoes? Uh, I think it's an eighty-three. Yeah, that's that's interesting considering that's the film that Goro Miyazaki made subsequently. Yeah. So anyway, just to continue my story, I I went to go look for it in HMV, like yeah, back when HMV actually existed. Oh my god. It was pretty sad. Single tear shed. Anyway, um I went there and I asked I right I was at the point where I was buying Studio Ghibli films left, right, and center. That was my phase at the point. And I went up to the guy and asked him if he had um Tales from Earthsea in, and if not, could he pre-order it? So the guy gave me a strange look and he goes to look it up on Amazon and it says that they don't even have it on V on uh, DVD yet. This was 2010. And um, I was kind of confused, so I checked it on Amazon. Yeah, so it turned out for just it turned out that uh, yeah, it wasn't on uh, it wasn't on uh, DVD. <laughs> Likelihood, hooray! <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah. Well, a Amazon is usually a good sense of when a movie's coming in or not. They have like postings and whatnot. That that's fair. Yeah, so I ended up I ended up looking for it online. And if I remember correctly, Tales from Earthsea had just finished its American dub premiere. Like it would just finish its run in theaters because we some for some reason we got the movie four years after it came out in Japan. What was what when did, wait did it come out? Two thousand. I read somewhere because I was looking at the English casting. It said two thousand and six. I think that's when it initially came out in theaters. Right. Okay. Um, so two thousand and ten. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, we we got put it like this. UK got it before you. Yes. <laughs> that's for us. Uh, we that's we got it before you. We got it. We got it like that... six months, six to months to possibly even longer than that before the US. Well, well that's a that's that's different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, I had to look it up online, and I ended up finding it on a site called Daily Motion. And this is before I really understood about like illegal streaming. Way to go. Yeah, so I ended up watching it there, and then I ended up watching it again a few months later because I was writing another blog on it. And then I ended up buying it in 2011, and I watched it again. And then I watched it again about seven or eight months later because it kind of like had this weird thing where I would remember it strongly and then it would like completely vanished my mind. I'm like, maybe I should check that again to see if I actually still don't like it. So I ended up watching it again for a fourth time. And then I watched it again the fifth time on Sunday, or the Sunday as of this recording, to um, 
discuss it here. And each time, like, it's kind of weird because I'm not, I don't think it's like the worst thing ever. It's, I, I, I can think of like a dozen movies off the top of my head that are far worse than it. I'm sure the two of you can occur, concur with that. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yeah, but like at the same time, it's it's a weird like misstep of a movie. I guess the best way to put it is that there's a train falling, going down a hill. There's no conductor in it, but it's not a loud explosion. <laughs> okay. I, I know it's a weird analogy. Mm. Yes, it is. The best thing that can come to my mind right now. It's just that it's 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 a it's a bizarre train wreck. It's fascinating, but very very quiet at the same time. It's one of those. It's one of those. Like, I, guess, I guess people who would see, uh, um, I don't know if anybody, if, if, if either of you have seen like the new Ant-Man trailer, it's, you know, like at the very end, spoilers for people who haven't seen that one, where um, Ant-Man is fighting, the I think his name is the Wasp, and he's in front of the Thomas the Tank Engine train, and he knocks it over. And then you just see like, an, in, like a, from a far away, like a tiny little toot toot, and the train falls over. It's kind of like that. All right, so I guess we've kind of really just, talked a little bit about that. I guess we can go more into detail about our discussion. You, you a little bit, you kind of took like 10 minutes describing your history with it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's stay on track now. Uh, no, note to fans, I have a tendency to go on tangents. Just, just a little bit, I'm noticing. Yeah. All right. So I guess we can probably discuss like our, our, our thoughts now. Since I've done a lot of talking, like, someone else can take over for a bit. <laughs> You're like, just make me stop talking. Um, well, since this is the first time that I've seen it, mm -hmm. I will admit it was a little hard to keep up with. Like, there were some points of the story here and there. I was like, wait, how is that relevant? Or wait, how does this connect to that? And I was... I thought it was a decent film it's just that there were parts of the story that were just confusing and things that aren't explained and it's just okay where are we going with this guys <laughs> yeah um just to add to that i remember uh the the doug walker on that guy with the glasses i'm mentioning doug walker don't tell anybody um oh my god yeah, but he mentioned in his Disney December video on the, the movie that he kind of found, I think it was like he said, the first two thirds of the movie are, to paraphrase him, are, are fascinating because they ask, they ask a lot of really small, big questions in a really small story. And then he's like, the last third does not answer any of them. Yeah, that's how I felt too by the time I finished it. I was like, there's a lot of build up, there's a lot of questions and pieces of the story. And then it was like, nothing got answered. Like, there was nothing. I'm like, okay, way to go. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Tama, what about you? I do I do agree with Doug's sort of view of it, that it's sort of, it's a very good, it's a very good world he builds, and it's a very good set of ideas that he puts in place. And then it, it feels like it's the beginning of something larger, but then he never actually, he never adds to that, and he never goes... Particularly because it is based upon a series of books that goes far, far beyond what what is actually covered in the film. And I mean, there are the character of the woman, the woman he he sort of rescues, is the main character of like another book by Ursula Gwynn. And it sort of it feels like it is the very much the Fellowship of the Ring of the series. And there's nothing else. That he could that he could have done that he could have pushed this out for two or three films and he do, he doesn't do it. Um, to give some history to the audience, uh, uh, Tales of Mercy I think was actually in, in like production for for twenty years. I think originally Miyazaki wanted to direct to to adapt it and Ursula Le Guin was like no because she had had some bad experience with adaptations of her work. And it was floating around for a while. I mean, there were other adaptations of this movie. There was a sci-fi movie. There was like a, a mini series. And, and finally, Ursula K. Le Guin, who was a big fan of Miyazaki, said, okay, I'll give you the go. And at the time, Miyazaki was busy on Howl's Moving Castle. So um, Toshio Suzuki, who is, it's like the, the longest running producer in Studio Ghibli Films, Offered it off to, uh, or auctioned it off to Goro Miyazaki, 
who had like no experience with anything in film outside of maybe some architectural stuff. Like he was an architect by 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 uh, design. Yeah, he's the guy I believe who designed, with, if not completely designed, then co-designed the uh, Ghibli Museum in Japan. So. And yeah. also another interesting fact. Uh, the movie was co-written by Kiko Niwa, who actually helped write um, The Secret World of Arietti and From Up on Poppy Hill. Okay. Yeah. So if you want proof that writers can improve their first projects, you just need to look at Tales of Earthsea. I believe it also takes some elements, or at least from inspiration from a, a short book that Miyazaki wrote, I think back when he was doing his very early stuff called The Journey of, Sh of let me double check on it, it's The Journey of Shita, which is a, which is a storybook that Miyazaki wrote um, fairly early on. Yeah, it's interesting because Tales from Earth sees um, um, Japanese name is Gido Senki. And I think Gido Senki is a reference to Miyazaki's story. So yeah, that would hold some credibility. Journey of Shuna is what is, is the name of the book, and it's, it, it's Gido it's, was like one of the characters in Shuna. Mm, I believe so, yeah. It, it, but but a lot of the themes, um, the design of the 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 animal that um, Aaron rides, I believe, is pretty much lifted wholesale from the Journey of Shuna. Right. So like it, it it's just a weird so it's a weird history because Goro initially didn't want to write the and direct the movie and he was kind of pressured into doing it and there was this big expectation that it was going to be another grand fantasy in the vein of his father and we all know what happens when you hype up something to that unrealistic degree. All of the pressure, all of it forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I mean, also, like, it's it's important to note as well that the movie won the Japanese equivalent of a Razzie. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Oh, no. And uh, Goro was, like, I think he was uh, the year's, like, most disappointing director. Oh, mm. no. Yeah, I know. And and I mean, like, I guess we'll talk about that in a bit, like whether or not it's fair to really um, put expectations on someone who isn't qualified to meet them. But it, it's just some interesting context there. There's a lot like the, the whole Wikipedia and, and like even the, the Ghibli Wikia has a lot of information on there that we cannot cover in, in, in the period of time that we're recording. Yay, because I'm learning everything today. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, but anyway, I guess we can probably like talk about uh, details that that stood out. Was there anything in particular that stood out to either of you? William Defoe. Willem, yeah, Willem Defoe. Oh God, Willem Defoe. Willem, Willem, Willem. The thing is, I'm sorry, I had to bring this up. Point, you had to, because I was Defoe. like, what in the world is Willem going Defoe. on here? Willem Defoe and. Uh, Timothy Dalton are probably, if not the best, then among the best dub actors that Ghibli has ever had for a film, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah. I enjoyed both of them, but I'm just like William Defoe. I'm like, what in the world is this? I know. <laughs> he sa he sounds like like the Green Goblin if he had a hoarse voice. <laughs> kind of does. It's yeah. Just, it's just it's just oh god. The I, I do I, I do actually like the way that he takes it. He goes, <laughs> and it's just it's just it's very it's a it's something that that someone like Willem Dafoe could only do because it's like no other actor could could take could just look at the character and go, you know what? I'm going to basically make him whisper for ninety percent of the film. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh it, it's interesting. I remember when I first. Because you, you like you see you see we're talking by the way talking about like the dub right now. I don't think any of us have seen the original. I have seen it in the original as well. She uh, in the original it's really really strange because um, the character of Cobb is actually voiced by a woman. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean it, it's something that that I don't particularly think that the character is actually. I mean he he does have quite an androgynous appearance, but it sort of seems quite interesting that they have gone. 
well, in the Japanese, he's in the Japanese Cobb is voiced by a woman. We're gonna have him voiced by. I don't think there was sort of a conscious thing of this character is not sort of. Yeah, he looks he looks androgynous, but he also yeah. he, so it could, you, I can see why they do that. I mean, like Studio Ghibli also uh, uh, Miyazaki decided to cast for Moro a male um, in Princess Mononoke. So this isn't like a bizarre idea, but at the no. same time, Cobb looks like a. David Bowie-esque Voldemort. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. oh God, yeah. This is so true. It's it's just the des- the design is decent, but it sort of it does feel very much like this character has been designed to sort of fit this trope and this trope and this trope, and it's just the voice is the best thing about the character, basically. Yeah, it's it's just it's 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 a weird like weird uh, scenario here. So uh, weird. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I, I mean, also, like, it, 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 you want a, an example of the Green Goblin whispering, as we said, but also, it, it's just, it's fascinating because this is, like, Willem Dafoe being himself. That end bit, oh my gosh. Oh, when, when, he, when he suddenly starts to, like, get out of breath? The end bit he is he is basically seems to be channeling the Emperor from Star Wars because <laughs> it's just the vo- the voice the voice is very much that sort of it does it's the voice the voice even the appearance sort of takes on the Emperor from Star Wars. It's like like as soon as what was it it was like as soon as I think it was it was Aaron who cut his arm off or something. Yeah. All of a sudden it's like this. 180 shift and i'm like where the hell did this go yeah i think my favorite line of of, of willem dafoe's portrayal is at the very end after he strangles um teru to death and then he's suddenly like she's dead she's dead so sad I, that, I can't watch that scene without <laughs> giggling <laughs> yeah that's the, the, the. The thing is, I with sat it, there when I saw the scene. I was, is, I and think, I was just like, "I'm done, I'm done." <laughs> yeah, because um, I mean, like Defoe was was kind of even though he was whispering his lines, he was consistent. Mm. So you can kind of get used to it. But then once he starts to like go into all that that emperor <laughs> mode, it, it's it's like, it, it, even by these movie standards, to cop out. I, I, I do agree with that. I, I do I do think if he had continued to do the the very whispery, the very sort of green goblinish sort of voice during that during the end scenes, but potentially sort of make it sound a little bit more crazy, I think it would have been worked far more effectively. Yeah, because I mean I know that he he jumps out of his voice once when he's confronting. Um... What was his name? He was confronting the big, the the main wizard. I think his Sparrowhawk. There we go. He was confronting Sparrowhawk, and Sparrowhawk yeah. was telling him about about abusing power and how that doesn't bring happiness. And then he's like, he just screams and he's like, "I'm already immortal" or something like that. That was the first sign where I'm like, okay, something's wrong here. Speaking of which, Timothy Dalton as Sparrowhawk. I honestly, this is gonna sound really strange. I've got no, I've gotten. I've got no issues with him at all. I think it's actually. I think he 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 brings across the i the, the the sort of the personality of this guy who is at once you know the powerful guy, but also sort of he is running from his past, but he's also sort of he feels he vo- Dalton voices the character like the character is meant to be voiced. I don't know whether Dalton actually know more about the books than sort of he was actually that he was given sort of in the film but he does bring the sort of the sense of a person who's got a lot of weight on his shoulders i i mean it's also it, it, it's weird because like when people think of timothy dalton like the traditional excuse me when the traditional role they think of like him as his his role as james bond that's one aspect of his of his uh uh, Dalton was actually a Shakespearean trained actor before James Bond. I'm not surprised by that, actually. He has a lot of class. And he actually, like, I mean, like, I think every single James Bond actor except for uh, one of them has had a career. But that's a different topic anyway. But <laughs> my point is, thank you for that, Steph. My point is that my point is that he's 
Timothy Dalton's voice is very, very, is very uh, rangy, and he has a lot of like a lot of on-screen per- charisma. So I'm not surprised that Disney decided to use him for the dub because he's actually one of their staple voice actors. In fact, there are a lot of staple voice. That. There are like Disney has a weird habit with their dubs of of including their own like stable, like like people from their sitcoms, people from their their animated movies, and then they just throw in celebrities here and there. And then they have, which is all I always find very fascinating, is they throw in kid actors too, which is really really nice because it's hard to train children to act, but if you can. You you usually get some fantastic performances from them. Ah, that's fair. I mean, what was it? Uh, granted, I haven't seen the whole freaking thing. Um, Full Metal Alchemist did something similar, the 2003 version with the English dub and for Alphonse. Right. So, that that is pretty interesting that they did that. But I also have to say, it's also interesting for me because I did look up the IMDb. Um, before and while watching the film, and there are actual like pretty well-known anime voice actors in there, too. I saw Liam O'Brien's name and uh, Karen Strassman's name hanging out in there, so. Karen Strassman. Oh, maybe she was one of the old ladies. I think... I I know Liam O'Brien had a small role in the beginning as one of the palace guards, and I want to say Karen Strassman was one of, like, the handmaidens for the queen in that early scene as well. That's what I want to say that they both had. Outside of that, I didn't recognize them in anything else. Not the movie. Also, like in terms of other voice actors that I do know, um, there is um, Cheech Marin as Hare. <laughs> Cheech Marin in the film is just. Has, he seems to basically be doing his typical Cheech and Chong sort of thing, but in a fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he's yucking it out there. Um, nice. They have uh, Kevin he Michael Richardson. You- I'm not sure if either of you know him. No. Um, he was the I, baritone palace guard that was chasing after Teru. Oh, 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 oh. That, that slave driver. Yes. Like yeah, and then they had, uh, they had uh, Jess Harnell, who Tama actually pointed out to me. He's the Hazard guy, and he, 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 he the, the, it's, it's a case with him of almost, the guy is, is doing far much more with that role than he really needs to, because it's like... Every, everybody there is doing, <laughs> everybody there is doing more than they need to, like, Matt Levin is Aaron. Yeah. Matt Levin is Aaron, so, um, yep. you basically have a Star Trek guy in there. Mariska Hardite, I think that's yep. her name. Which I, every single time I I, I, I hear Mariska Hargitay's name, I think of that one line from the Love Guru. Uh, from the Love Guru, really? Yeah, because um, Mike Myers' character instead it greets everybody by saying Mariska Hargitay, Mariska Hargitay. So I, I keep thinking of that line whenever I hear her voice. Well, I'm just thinking like Law and Order, really, because because yeah, Law and Order. Quite the experience. Anyway, as I was saying, so yes, my my one your problem, your big problem with the dub is is it's actually not as big a problem as you would think, but I don't like the voice for Teru at all. You don't like Teru? No, I, I well look, I don't like Teru, but that's besides the point. I I don't like the voice dub for Teru. I'm sure that Blair Restanio was trying her damnedest, and she does get the singing right, and she does improve near the end, like in the last 20 minutes, but she's just not a voice actress. Like, I think Disney only recruited her because she was on a Disney Junior show, and they needed somebody to fill in a slot, but... It's, it's possible that that's what they did. I, I can see where you're coming from, but at the same time, she, she is... You know, she's been abandoned by her parents, you know, I, I, the, the voice, the, um, she gets across emotion particularly well as the character, I think. I don't. I was about to say, I'm like, wait, this girl has gone through a lot of stuff by the time we actually see her in the film. Right. So it kind of reflects in her performance a bit, but at the same time, I see what you're also saying, Whitley, it's like, it does get better in the end, but it's also in the beginning, it's a little rough to start with. Mm. I mean, even I would agree that there are places where, you know, she's not brilliant. I think, I think, partic- I think, however, though, if you'd gone for a voice actress who 
wasn't as good a singer as she is, I don't think the character would have worked overall as well. Because remember that, that the the song the, the the song is a particularly important part of her character. Right. Mm-hmm. I I just think that it's I don't know if it, I think that um, Blair probably should have gone for like a few voice acting lessons first because. She had, like I said, she, she like she and her sister, from what I remember reading, uh, they share a, uh, a they shared a sitcom, uh, a kids show together, and um, they're both apparently really talented singers. It's just that she is not a great actress, and it kind of comes through. But everybody else is fine. I remember reading on that note in a uh, I have a book on uh, like, it's like, it's like critical analysis of Studio Ghibli's movies from Nausicaa, The Valley of the Wind, all the way to Ponyo. And um, it talked about how there were distinct choices in the Japanese that were lost in translation. Like they chose a, ba- they chose a, a bass singer for, um, for I think it was uh, Sparrowhawk. And they chose like, a really, really popular uh, pop vocalist, Teru Tish, I think, I don't, I, don't what, I don't remember what her name is, but she sings there's a there's a version of Teru no Yuta, which is Teru's song, on YouTube that is sung by the voice actress in the movie in the Japanese dub. There is also that really bizarre choice to have her singing in Japanese in the in, on the credits and have her sing in the film in English. Now, okay, you know, she might not have the range to do it, but it it it, it seems like a bizarre decision to go. Oh, we're going to have her song in the film you know in english but we're not going to dub the other song which is sung by her actor by her seiyu in japanese into english and it seems to be honest a little bit half-assed because it's it's still from teru's perspective it's still a very good song and it just seems like you know if you are going to have you are going to pick a singer over having a voice actress dub both the songs don't sort of go i will have one song yeah watch they're either they were either lazy with it or it was like oh we need to keep within our budget for this dub let's skip dubbing that song it's probably one of those well i mean i i would probably i guess it would it would have to i don't maybe they ran out of money because disney for the most part doesn't half-ass their dubs they're not that they don't like i've, I've listened to every single dub that they have done for a studio Ghibli movie even their lesser ones they put a lot of effort into, so I don't think it's a matter of half-assing it. I think yeah. they just probably added the money. Yeah, like for like I, I for example, I'm not fond of the dub, but I have to admit the Ponyo dub is very, very good. And even you know the fact that you've got two younger younger siblings of fairly famous people, and I think it's a a a better dub overall than you know, for example, a lot of other anime dubs. Right. Also with this, with Teru's song, I guess the only problem I can think of with it is that it goes on for too long. Mm. It goes on for, I think, four minutes. And I'm like, when I'm listening to it, like... It goes on on forever and ever and ever. And as I'm listening to it, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I get the point. Wrap it up, wrap it up, wrap it up. They, and then they, and then they see like Aaron crying while he's listening to it. And by the way, Aaron has the best emo face of any anime character I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. This, like, this rivers of tears coming down his face. Yes. Oh my god. It reminded me of, um, because at the time of recording this, the day before, I, I was watching that whole um, Funimation double talk, uh, double talk block. Yeah. And um, I was watching this Tokyo Ghoul Route A, and it made, and the whole streaming of tears that Aaron has made me think of Sukiyama as he's trying to get Kaneki to not go and he's just lying on the roof just like a lake of tears going on with him and that just made me bring that up in my head I'm like oh my god I honestly think that scene works quite effectively I think it is better in the dub really I think it works quite effectively because up until that moment we have he's basically been he he's sort of he has spent a lot of time sort of and it's the first moment where really the impact of what he has actually done yeah sort of comes to the surface I think it works very well I uh, but I also like the one yeah. sorry the one complaint that I also do have though and this is an animation complaint too because the animation is really generic mm. even though it looks good is that when he cries, he cries jello tears. 
Yeah, but that's that's a that is a problem with Ghibli overall. I think I Ghibli is the one of the biggest issues Ghibli has with animation is animating the tears because they don't look yeah. quite right. But yeah, another film that reminds me of that I think was um I think that that, that comes to mind right away was Totoro. I think Totoro did something like that too. That's only that's one of the first ones that my mind went to when you were saying that. So no, but I, I mean like even by Ghibli standards, it just looks really really basic, which. Would not bother me if, like, I mean, like, look, Tales of Mercy looks good. Every Studio Ghibli movie looks good, but it, there's not a lot of passion behind the animation. The character models look very generic. The scenes look very generic. There's great, there's great cinematography in the movie itself. Like the scene where the background shots, like when they go into Whore Town and when Ka, when uh, Sparrowhawk is riding on his horse with the with his torch lighting up. Those are great scenes. They look good. But there isn't a lot of personality behind the actual look of the movie itself. I think the only particular point where... The thing is, I think the backgrounds are visually stunning, but, you know, to expect anything other than visually stunning out of Ghibli is really sort of... is, is really sort of not what they do. I think I think the, the shot of the, of the beach ships is very good. But it's sort of, oh, and we see it for five seconds, and it's sort of then hand-waved away, and it's... Yeah. It does feel like, it does feel like it's almost sort of Ghibli by numbers. It's like, oh, we need a panoramic shot of this, of sort of, look how, look how we've done the, the art design of this. And it's, it feels very much, once they get out of Hort Town, that basically the background lot just sort of pack up and sort of go home and leave the rest of, the rest of the team to sort of design the rest of the backgrounds, because it never, it never seems after they leave Hort at all visually stunning. Yeah. And I remember, uh, I'm also going to quote another person on the internet, J- uh, Jessu Otaku, when she was doing her her uh, retrospective videos and she came to this one, she mentioned um, that it almost plays off like, I'm going to paraphrase her, here's a field, here's a town, here's a castle, here's a wizard and this is what he does. It's almost like they're throwing these ideas out there and it almost, I guess to put it in my words, it's, it's Goro Miyazaki had the pieces for a fantasy movie, he didn't know where to put them all. Mm. I mean, I like the film, but even I would agree, it's not Ghibli's best. It's not close to Ghibli's best. Yeah. Yeah, and like that whole that whole paraphrasing thing you just did kind of w- does have an effect on the actual story. Because yeah. going back to the story, it's like you start with these big ideas and these interesting questions, and then there's nothing by the time you get to the end of it. Well, I also argue there's no there's no payoff really. I'd also argue that there's another problem. So I'd also argue there's another problem with 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 posing big questions. Cause I, I mean, like personally, I don't believe in stupid questions. I believe in stupid answers, but I do believe in an interesting questions. And Tales from Earthsea answers will ask a lot of big questions as if they're meant to be these grand, important questions, and they're not. They're basic fantasy 101. The whole idea of the ring from Lord of the Rings is far more fascinating than any question posed in this movie. And that's like, how long is it in that movie for? Just just the, the, the whole trilogy or just the one film? No, no, just like the whole background of the ring. Like the, the whole, okay, fine. The, the questions that are raised from the, the, uh, the preamble in the first Lord of the Rings movie are far more interesting. That like that, that 20 minute segment is far more interesting than this entire movie. Yeah, that's a fair assessment. Yeah. I think the problem is, as well, is Goro goes and he, he, he adapts, to be honest, the hardest two books of the main Earthsea Quartet to sort of do. Had he gone and done the first two books, which are The Tombs, of the, which are The Wizard of Earthsea and The Tombs of Atuan, I think he would have had a much better film out of it. Because the first book is, the first, the first book is essentially the growing up of Sparrow Hercules, who's called um, in the first two books called Ged, and the rescue of the of his of his female friend from the tombs of Atuan. I think that would have made a much better film because the 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 other two books, which are the farthest the farthest shore, which is where um, Aaron comes from, and the fourth book, which is uh, Tahani, which is where Teru comes from, are particularly in the case of Ter- of, of Tahanu, really slow moving and it's it seems almost like Goro's gone well because dad has tried to do these two books 
I will try and do these two, but and it, it, it's it will be a hard task even for I think Miyazaki's senior to adapt the the, the, the last two books. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot we can talk about, so I guess we can talk about like a lot of the negatives every, the whole day. There's so much to talk about here that doesn't work. Now we can talk about the negatives. I thought. No, we no, I, 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 I'm, I'm being, I'm being facetious. I'm being facetious. We've already been covering the negatives. Um, I guess we can probably move. Because there's a lot to say about this. I know there is. There's a lot to say about it. The movie is really slow. The characters aren't very interesting. Aaron is probably the most interesting character in the movie, and he is a downer to watch. I I think I do agree that he's sort of he is the most interesting character. I do think it was very brave of Goro to go against sort of the Ghibli mold of the sort of the peppy, the main character who sort of has this very can-do attitude. I think to go and sort of create to go into the psyche of someone really complex and who's basically starts the film by murdering his father. You know, I think I think under a better director, this could have been a really, really good character, a sort of analysis piece. Yeah, it probably could have. But then again, it's also a first time like movie. So and, and like mo- most most first time movies are, are even the good ones are usually not like a director's best. And if they are, that's a bad sign. We don't want the Shyamalan effect all over let's, again. Let's, ta- let's talk about Perfect Blue. No. Yeah. I, I do think that it's sort of, for a first debut, for somebody who basically got sh- pushed into doing the role by his dad, it does seem like he has tried his best to create a really good story. And he's sort of, to an extent, he has been given sort of not brilliant pieces to work with. And he's basically, oh God, I've got to try and do the film that dad never could. Yeah. Back, back to the whole um, expectation thing. That was brought up earlier like there was a lot of pressure and a lot of expectations on Goro Miyazaki after his father just like no I don't want to do this one so it definitely probably it more than likely had an effect on the final product of this film well and I know that's what I, feel. I know that there was a huge like dispute between the two Miyazaki's Hayao Miyazaki basically said son you're too young for this I am not supporting you and it sounds like but I need your help and then finally, the movie comes out, and Miyazaki's like, "Yeah, you're right. I, I was being, I, I was being a jerk. I will help you out from now on." Um, when is Hayao Miyazaki not being a jerk? <laughs> I mean, like Just a saying. jerk. I, well, there's a the difference between being a jerk and being unhelpful. Let, let's put it that way. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, you do get with the next film that it was Goro May, which is up on Poppy Hill. You do get a sense that his cinematic voice is starting to evolve and he's 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 starting to essentially step out of his father's shadow because first off that's a very good that's a very different film than we've expected from ghibli and second of all it doesn't really sort of ever sit and sort of sit on the ghibli or on the typical dip ghibli tropes because it's it's a good film but it's also a lot darker than we've ex- than we've had from most of what miyazaki's put together sort of over the last now 30 years mm-hmm. Now, I do also want to point out the soundtrack. The soundtrack by Carlos Nunez in Tales from Earthsea is fantastic. It's it's. I honestly don't remember it that much, but then again, I, I I honestly like was bored throughout the movie. I will say that. So. Oh. Like, cause I remember like the soundtrack Be completely was. Completely honest. Okay, that's fine. Like the soundtrack was keeping me awake for most of it, actually. And it's really a shame because, like, I don't know a lot about Carlos Nunez, but I think that he deserved a better movie. I, 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 going back to what I said earlier, I do think that, that it, particularly in the Japanese version, but to be honest, in both of them, that Teru's singing is very good. I think it actually works quite well, and it actually fits into the soundtrack as a whole and the style that the soundtrack is going for, which is that sort of slightly pseudo celtic yeah sound. It definitely serves the film. It serves the film very well. I think I think the the sort of particularly series the song comes at an extremely emotive time. It sort of sums up what has been through it sends, it sums up the film better than the film sums the film up. Yeah, I, I that's like I said, like I think that it deserved a better movie. The soundtrack. Mm. Yeah, like, um, Steph. Afterwards, I would I would encourage you to, to listen to some of the tracks on YouTube and tell me that the the, the tracks are, are aren't good because it'd be pretty hard not to. 
Even the most ardent critics of Tales from Earthsea have acknowledged that its soundtrack is fantastic. It's, 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 the, the movie is kind of weird. This is part of the problem with talking about the movie because it's so weird discussing it. Just for those uh, those who are listening to this right now, we had a lot of technical difficulties and one of the big running jokes was that it was a sign that we're not supposed to be talking about this film. <laughs> it's a sign. No one wants us to talk about Tales from Earthsea. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah, that was the running joke right there. Now, the, the underlying question, I guess, that can be brought up is um, does okay? So it's actually a twofold question. So the first one is kind of obvious. Does this film deserve the criticism it gets? Kinda. Kinda. Yeah, I would say kinda. I think it does too. I don't think it deserves I mean, all the. There are some things where it works, and then other things, obviously, that it doesn't. I mean, I wasn't paying attention to the soundtrack, but you guys loved it. And then there's like. The story, again, it was a bit ambitious. Mm -hmm. And then it just decided not to really end itself in a good way. Right. There was still a lot of loose ends and questions remaining. And it just, just the whole flow of the entire story just kind of was lackluster. Right. In a way. To be fair, though, I mean, Ghibli films have always had a problem with, with uh, get to return to what Doug, Doug Walker said, I mean, a lot of the Ghibli films... The endings seem very rushed. I mean, it, it, it's not so much with Miyazaki's own stuff, but if you look, for example, at sort of uh, the secret world of Arietti, I mean, again, they're sort of they're wrapping the film up as the credits are going, and it's sort of oh, like, Whisper of the Heart is the worst offender of them all. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree with that. It's just sort of oh, I love you, uh, and then the film ended. <laughs> Hold on, I mean, because Earth Sea was. 2006. Arietti was like what 2008, 2009. 2010. But if you're like, so if you're like comparing Earth C to films before it came out rather than afterwards, I think like because I'm, I'm, I mean like I love Totoro, I love Princess uh, Mononoke, uh, Howl's Moving Castle was before this, I believe. Two years. That ago. one was a little bit rushed in the end. Mm. That one was a little bit rushed in the end, and then Spirited Away was pretty good too. So like. If you're talking about Earth C compared to stuff that came before, it's a different story than what came after it, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I guess we, we can agree that it deserves the criticism it gets. But now here's the bigger question. Now, this is one that I think kind of irks me to some degree. Do you think that Goro Miyazaki uh, deserves the, the criticism he gets as, a, as, a, as an individual? No. Oh, God. No. No, I don't think so either. When I mean... He, First off, as I've said earlier, it's it's a first film. Nobody's first film is ever going to be perfect. If they are, you know, you start sort of going, uh, the and then your second film, please. I I do think that Goro has essentially exonerated himself of the issues with Earthsea by making Poppy Hill, which is a much more cons consummate film. I think it's I think particularly sort of considering it is a film regarding two people who fall in love and sort of the, their fam their their familial re relationship shall we say not to spoil it to because it's it's to go from you know two films are fairly dark and sort of go and sort of learn from your mistakes and make a better film proves that sort of goro is if not an equal to his father at least is sort of a decent director and does not deserve the criticism the criticism so much as the film he made does. Yeah, I mean, right. and it does, and it doesn't. It also doesn't help that for Goro Miyazaki, since this was his first film, he's also in the shadow of his father, and there's that pressure and expectation mm -hmm. that everyone is looking out for. So that doesn't help it either. I mean, I made a joke about it like a couple minutes ago, but Perfect Blue and Stone, for so, like it's not for me. It's not Perfect Blue is not the best that he's done. Millennium Actress, the second film that he directed after that love it to pieces so you're not going to get an amazing film from a, a for a director on their first try i mean it's it, it does gonna happen it, well it does happen sometimes but it's very rare it's sometimes, but, like it's rare i mean just to give some other examples as well um uh james cameron's first movie was piranha 2 the spawning no one remembers that so it, wonderful 
Yeah, Francis Lawrence, who directed the, who's directing the Hunger Games movies now. His first movie was Constantine. Yeah, it's 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 really hard. They, they, like I remember here once hearing from uh, one of my professors in university, you don't go to film school to learn how to make a movie. You go to film school to learn the basics of making a movie, but you learn how to make a movie as you're doing it. Yeah, it, it's it's that practical hands-on experience that's, that you can carry on to the next project that'll help make you better. You you can't learn this stuff in a classroom. It's very, very hard to do. I mean, like, even me as a theater major, you can't learn how to act or stage manage or build stuff in a classroom setting to actually get that hands-on training and experience in order to really learn from it. Yeah. I mean, also, it goes for any any artistic profession or any profession in general. Like, I love writing, yeah. and you, I'm sure you, you've read my... You've, you, both of you read my stuff, and a lot of people have read my stuff here that are listening to it, but... You read a lot of stuff. I know, and, like, I, I've, I've read some of my old work from high school, and it's terrible. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing with me. I mean, when I started my review blog as I eat my... <laughs> And when I started my blog five years ago, and I look back on like my first review to now, writing wise, it's a drastic difference. Yeah, and I think and that, I used to be terrible at writing in high school, so. Yeah, I think it, I think it, it is it is a little unfair to to hear because, as I mentioned in that article that I wrote on um, on Infinite Rainy Day, Miyazaki Sargora Miyazaki will forever be measured by the yardstick of his first failure, not his first success, which is, I think, really unfair. Well, up until he makes something that's sort of completely sort of thing, but then again, that's sort of that is that's a potential thing that could happen in the future. Yeah, well, I mean, also, uh, Goro has also come out and stated that um, in an interview when he was talking about Ranya the Robber's daughter, which I've heard is also pretty decent, um, that he is not an artist like his father. Who was it? Who was it? Who um, looked at it during season one? Of course, was it Joe? I want to say it was Joe. Who was that one? Like, what was it? Last season or the season before that? I don't know. I, uh, uh, I think it was Joe. I'm pretty sure it was. I'm probably wrong. But I'm yeah. Sure oh yeah. Yeah. It was. It was Joe. It was Joe. It was Joe. It was Joe. I'm right. <laughs> I'm sorry. It had to click there. I honestly think that's quite a brave thing for someone to go. Is sort of. I am not sort of. You know. You are going to get something different from me than you have got from my father. I'm not my father, and it's. I. I think that's that is the key thing you got to remember when you're sort of looking at Earthsea. Is first off, it's not Heya Miyazaki, it's Goro, and Goro has a completely different style. And Goro's films are quite actually sort of um. I would say on the whole, from the first, the two films he has made so far, are actually much darker than than sort of the work of his father. Yeah, it's, it's hard because some people don't realize, or sometimes they won't remember, that there are two different people, they have different personalities, different yeah. um, thoughts and views on things, and occasionally, and I do think that also that girl, uh, Miyazaki uh, was brave in telling that I am not my father, this is not what you're going to get from me, because it's almost like a reminder to people that I'm a different person. I am not my dad. You're not going to get what he gave you. I'm different. This is what you're getting from me. Right. And to have that be reminded, especially for people who love Ghibli movies, I think that's not only a brave thing to do, but I also think it's a good thing to do. Because right. people tend to forget that kind of thing. Right. So, overall, I guess we're finally coming to our conclusion. The one other comment I do want to make is actually regarding Le Guin's own view of the film, which is sort of actually is quite interesting from a from someone who sort of got who who's not received a lot of good adaptions of her work. I mean, the live action series that you mentioned earlier, Whitley, is is she hates it. She hates most adaptions of her work. And I'm quite surprised that she actually did that although I do like this adaption, I'm surprised that she did too. Although her sort of comments of sort of since then have been a little bit more I think she was marginally on the fence about this one. I think her, her words are like, It is your movie, not my movie. It is a good movie, but it's not my movie. Something like that. But yeah, I, I, I do think it's sort of you've got to regard it as an adaption of her work. I do agree with her view on it. I do also think that it's it sort of to adapt the harder two books of the earth because I, this is I think the first to adapt the first adaption that's actually been of these two books. So it's sort of to to adapt 
the harder end of the Earth's of the Earth's sea quartet is is quite a brave move. And I, I I also don't I also think that even if Goro even if circumstances had been much different and Goro was not pressured into this, I'm not sure if it would have been that much better because Goro was a first timer, mm. and it's a very hard book to adapt. It's not like Goro's not like Peter Jackson where Peter Jackson has like years of experience and knows what he's doing every step of the way with like the Lord of the Rings movies which by the way was also a huge risk people forget that it could have easily failed but this is a guy who was asked to do something didn't want to agreed to anyway and we kind of got like a, an end result that was a little disappointing but what else were you expecting yeah there was there was a, a lot of factors that came to play here really not just like one specific thing there was just a lot going on with it yeah we, would we recommend people watch it? Um, I don't really know, honestly. I mean, because this is the first film I've seen from Gordo Miyazaki. So, because I, so, I haven't seen from up on Poppy Hill. I can't say, like, for sure. Um, as a first-time watcher of this in general, um, I thought it was okay. Not my favorite thing in the world. It's not the best that I've ever seen from Ghibli in general. Obviously, yeah. but I don't think it's bad, all things considered. It was just, for lack of better words, it was just disappointing by the end. And Tama? I honestly think that it's it's worth a watch if only to sort of go, this is what, this is a different director, this is a different take, this is sort of something we haven't seen from Ghibli before. I would say on the whole, it's 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 very much a diamond in the rough, but I think it, it it has it's a film that has been panned a little bit too much. Yes, it's got problems, but I honestly think it, it it's worth a, a worth a look in terms of sort of the Ghibli repertoire. Okay, so I actually I'm kind of somewhat iffy. On one hand, I think it deserves the the, the critical praise, the critical lack of praise it got. I think 41% on Rotten Tomatoes is pretty reasonable for something like this. Um, but that having been said, I do think that it's worth a watch out of curiosity's sake, particularly because, well, one, you could, they say you can learn a lot from bad movies. And I'm not talking about like the whole, I want to get the feels. If you want to get the feels, you can just have a hot, a hot poker up your rectum. You'll get feels that way. But in terms of, in terms of, yeah, I, I, I'm waiting to say that line. Um, but in terms of, as far as bad movies go, there is a lot of interesting stuff in the movie. So I do think that it's worth watching on that level. I don't think it's worth watching routinely, though, just so you can get a sense of where Goro started. But outside of that, um, I don't think it's really worth long-term viewing. And it's a shame because even like some of, I mean, I've seen it more than, I've seen it several times, but I've only, every time I've seen it, it was because I had to see it for a reason. But it's a shame because even Studio Ghibli's worst in most situations, it still has potential potential to be watched again and enjoyed outside of its quality and this is the first and only time i can't say that yeah i mean that that makes sense i mean for me i i, I kind of wanted to say like but i was talking about i did want to be like it's it'd be cool to see like where goro miyazaki came from but i can't even say that because i haven't seen anything else he's done so i can't even I, it's hard for me to really give that critique of it and my recommendation without having seen anything else he's done it's just right. <laughs> All right. hard so that's that about wraps it up um, for now for our first really disjointed incredibly technical difficulties heavy <laughs> podcast episode <laughs> so many problems you have no so the many. people watching this will have no idea because we did a lot of behind the scene edits oh so much editing but, so much editing and so much shenanigans yeah hopefully as, as we as we get a groove uh, things will start to improve more um, one would hope but and, and unfortunately uh Tama cannot sign out with us because he got cut off completely um, but <laughs> it's a sign. It's a sign. 
Well, screw I that keep sign. Saying that. Screw that sign. That sign can oh. go be put in a trash can with all the other signs. You're not gonna be the one editing this together, though. That's gonna be me, and you will probably see me saying that over and over again while I edit this thing together. Yeah, um, you have my sympathy, sister. <sighs> but yeah, that's about it for now. Again, Tama, we're sorry you you could not finish this with us. Um, we love, really we miss love you, Tama. We really miss, miss you. you. Tama. <laughs> we hug you. We kiss you, Tama. <laughs> only, only Steph will get that joke. Yo. Um, but anyway, uh, that's about it na- for now. And uh, join us next month with another episode of Heavy Storms, where we discuss the really bad anime shows and movies out there. And uh, as a record, I probably won't be on the next episode. But if I am, you probably probably none of us will be. <laughs> But if, you, if, if, if I am, you might see me in a different role, and it'll give me a chance to get some perspective. So uh, thank you, and have a, a good evening, uh, or a good afternoon, or a good morning, or whatever time you're watching this at. Bye. <laughs>